My name is Alison Van Unenum and I'm a Cooperative Extension Specialist in Animal Biotechnology and Genomics at the University of California in Davis. So the um, American Association of Animal Science asked me to write a review paper on the health uh, and of livestock populations that are consumed genetically engineered feed. And so we reviewed all of the controlled peer-reviewed studies that have been done in this area. And the vast majority of these studies have shown no detrimental effects associated with the consumption of genetically engineered feed, as you might expect, because when you eat something, you digest the DNA and the protein, um, and they're not toxic ingredients and so those animals have, uh, they're compositionally equivalent to non-genetically engineered feed crops and so there's been no changes in the productivity or health of animals as a result of eating those crops. When you're looking at field observations, of course, there's, you just have the data and the, the power of this data set, I think, is that it's such a large data set. There's so many billions of animals involved. So it's estimated that more than 95% of our livestock populations in the US are eating genetically engineered feed um, and have been doing so since the introduction of the crops back in 1996. And so since that time, it's over 100 billion animals in the US have been eating these products because we raise around 9 billion chickens every year in the US and of course several million dairy cattle, beef cattle, um, pigs, all of whom are consuming corn, soy, alfalfa, um, cottonseed meal, all of which would come from genetically engineered varieties and so uh, these livestock populations have really been uh, consuming these products uh, almost continuously at least for the last decade. But of course you don't have a control group that wasn't getting genetic genetically engineered feed and so what we were able to do was look at trends prior to the introduction of genetically engineered feed and then we looked um, at the years after the introduction and particularly the last decade so there have been a handful of very uh, sensational studies that have shown very contradictory results. We've had the Seralini study with the big tumours and we've had a pig study that suggested that they had inflamed stomachs. And I think what's really interesting is that these studies have been unilaterally um, condemned by both regulators and independent scientists for not adhering to very basic scientific principles in setting up their experimental design. For example, in the Seralini study, they used a variety of rat that is well known to develop tumours by two years of age, and that's been documented in the literature back to the 1950s. And you'll notice in that study that the control group is not pictured uh, in the pictures with the rats with tumours, and it would be expected that 80 to 90% of two-year-old rats of that strain would have spontaneous tumours, irrespective of any treatment that they might have been associated with. And so there's a number of concerns with studies like that, small uh, numbers of animals, uh, very many treatment groups, such that um, any statistical findings that are in there have the potential to be uh, just spurious correlations or happening by chance. And I think that, you know, there are very clearly defined protocols for how to go about doing an animal feeding trial. Animal scientists have been doing animal feeding trials for a long time. And it's very frustrating that these groups don't adhere to these protocols because these protocols are set up to have replicates and the appropriate sample size to ensure that statistically important findings are actually due to the treatment rather than just change. And when you ignore these protocols, then you have these findings that appear to be very um, sensational and, and are being suggested to be caused by the treatment, when in fact it's the experimental design is very poor and they're not following standard protocols. And there's really no excuse for scientists not to follow these standard protocols because they're, they're written in the OECD guidelines. Um, and so I think that's where scientists get very frustrated when these poorly designed studies with very small sample size and poor controls get amplified in the media because they're really not agreeing at all with the hundreds of studies that have found no difference and there's no mention made of these other hundred studies in these sensational papers and as a scientist if I get a very you know unusual result that doesn't agree with the consensus of the scientific literature it's my responsibility to look at the bulk of the scientific literature and explain why my study might have found something very very different rather than just ignoring the hundred studies that don't agree with what mine says as if mine is the first study that's ever been done.